Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Talking TSR, where we kick back. It, imagine that we're at Gen Con, you know, when we used to go to Gen Con, and uh, it's the end of Saturday, and we've been playing games all day, and we're back at the, I don't know, let's just say the Hyatt, the Hyatt bar, um, and uh, and we're just talking, um, talking TSR, talking all things um, old school gaming. Um, as always, my co-host to my virtual left is Rick. How you doing, Rick? I'm doing good. How's life treating, my friend? It's good. It's good. Some summer continues to roll on. Things are quieter. Uh, it was a little busier a couple of weeks ago, but things are kind of settling into uh, a little bit more routine, uh, which is good. Uh, we've got the uh, dying Earth Kickstarter going on. Um, we're in the the middle of that. You know, closing in on the end of that. So folks might want to check that out. Um, and outside of that, no, everything everything's good. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. Um, you know, fully vaccinated. My players are getting there. We are planning our first in-person session. So I am, nice. you know, now we're running into, instead of pandemic stuff, I'm happy to say we're just running into vacation plan issue, yeah. you know, so it's like trying to herd cats, but we're getting everybody together and making it happen. So uh, I was just talking to people about that. So I am nice. very psyched to get people around the table. Um, yeah, we've definitely. we've had uh, we've had live gamers around the table the last couple of times for board game night. Uh, ironically, yesterday we got together and we we played two more games of Pandemic Legacy, which we had started ironically before the pandemic, and we had gotten we got into September of the campaign, and it's a great game. I mean, it is it is a great game. Um, and then obviously we had to stop because uh, we actually didn't own the game. One of my buddies owned the game. So otherwise I probably would have finished it on my own um, in the last year and a half. But no, so we actually we actually busted that out and played a couple of sessions of that. And um, it's good. It's good getting back to uh, in-person gaming. I get a little yeah. bit more, gives you a little something extra, a little something, something to look forward to uh, during yeah. the week and everything. So Very thematic. <laughs> yes, very I love much. legacy games. I'm really starting to become a fan of those. I, my son and I play the Clank Legacy and a few things. So uh, yeah, yeah, I, I have to. If, if you're into legacy games, um, I have to make a recommendation: Sleeping Gods. Sleeping mm -hmm. Gods. You will, um, you will love it. You'll love it, and and I think your son would like it too. So, um, yeah. it's it's That's done. Right. It's done right. It's a legacy game done right. Um, and you know, it's got the medieval themes and everything in there. But it's cool. It's cool. It's got some Cthulhu themes in there. So. Yeah, it's good. It's cool. good. Um, but we're not here to talk about board games. Maybe another episode will do Maybe that. another episode. Yeah, but we're here to talk about old classic modules. And if you couldn't figure out over up uh, on the other side there, uh, today we are going to be talking about the classic module L1, The Secret of Bone Hill. Um, and this is, this is, a good, this is uh, one of my favorite modules. I do understand um, that there is a little bit of critical review on this one um, for, for various reasons. And, and I agree with a lot of that, but um, I think there's a lot of really good treasures hidden in this module. Um, and we're gonna talk about it for the next hour or so. Um, and then later on in the show, we'll give you our top five um, you know, uh, overall encounters, uh, our top five favorite encounters that we both prefer. I'm sure we're gonna get some crossover there. Uh, we usually do so, but uh, let's kick it off. Um, give me, give me, uh, you know, a, a high view um, uh, opinion of what you think about L1, the secret of Bone Hill. Sure. Um, well, you know, before diving into the adventure, I feel like we should talk about Len Lakopka himself well, because, yeah. I, you know, I think much like the adventurer, he sort of flies under the radar a little bit when it comes to the big names surrounding D and D, and he shouldn't because to me, he is one of those figures that was a key figure that was just there in all the proper moments, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Len, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, passed uh, this past October, I think. So we just lost yeah. him. Um, but yeah, for, for an, uh, an individual who was never, to the best of my knowledge, a staff member of TSR, he had a lot of influence. Um, as, as my understanding goes, he was originally a big diplomacy bluff, you know, that, that game you don't play if you want to keep your friends. <laughs> and evidently through that and uh, the International Federation of uh, War Gamers, the IFW, he met Gygax, who was then Gygax, who was, I think, the vice president of the IFW at that time. Uh, Len himself eventually became the president of the IFW, and that really grew a friendship between the two. Um, 
Len was involved in the planning and orchestration of the early Gen Cons, the earliest Gen Cons. Um, he was among, I know, the group that Gygax shared what was then the sort of prototype of Chainmail with before the fantasy element was added to Chainmail. Gygax shared it with a small group of players, and Len was one of them. Um, and Len added his commentary there. Len's actually credited, I believe, in the second edition of Chainmail as, as either an author or a contributor. Um, he really ran Gen Con 2. Um, he eventually came out with his own zine. I was, again, more diplomacy-based uh, liaison. I'm, I'm going to not pronounce this right. Liaison dangerousness. Is, we can put that grid up. Um, but it was a sort of zine he published in his association with the IFW that was dedicated to, to diplomacy. But the cool thing about it was him and Gygax eventually kind of post d and started publishing articles about d and in that zine, which is really cool. So you can kind of see some very early stuff um, that was written by the both. Most of those are actually written by Len and just credited to Gary to kind of keep the thing legal. Um, but I found some gems going back and looking through some of those zine copies. I even found one where Len was, you know, just a, a, a fuchsia and bragging and just, you know, terrifically happy that Gen Con had hit a thousand people in attendance, you know, and I think way how things change, you know, so, um, and yeah, uh, what else? It's so many things, I don't know where to stop. Um, he edited the manuscripts for the first edition Players Handbook for the first edition DMG um, and contributed to the both of those. And last but not least, uh, we have Liam Munn's Tiny Hut, which to me is fabulous column. So good, the kind of column I miss, I really miss seeing that kind of nuts and bolts column where people get into those crazy tables and details. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have a, a graphic for that too. That started in dungeon uh, issue 30 and ran all the way to dungeon 108. So it went from uh, 1979 to I think 1985 or 1986. So it had really a hell of a span. Um, and eventually even got a header that was designed by Darlene of Greyhawk map fame, you know, she did the little top illustration for his column. Uh, so yeah, such a history there, you know, uh, of our author that we're talking about. So yeah, yeah. to me, it would be, uh, I would be, you know, remiss to not to not touch on that. Yeah, I, I think he's a, a definitely a fascinating personality that, like you said, flies under the radar, um, mm -hmm. not actually a TSR employee at any point, which, which I, I think that was probably the one thing that surprised me. I think he just assumed that he was. I mean, he had his he had his hands in so many different pots, and he was like you said with um you know the the player's handbook and the dungeon master's guide and play testing. Apparently, he was an avid player, and and so he was you know I, I guess I could see he probably also was play tester for some of their other games that they were doing at the time. He just seemed like he was the type of person that just played 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 and and um and then gave some good constructive feedback so it really um yeah I, I would have to agree i think uh spending a couple of minutes just talking about all the other different things that he did um i think is is definitely fine and and then you know to actually you know bring it all back around to l1 and you really can't talk about l1 without sort of talking a little bit about l2 and l3 um and and basically him you know getting a little piece of Greyhawk. Guy Gag said, yeah, sure, you, we can put your, your campaign setting essentially in, in Greyhawk and basically taking the Lendor Isles and, and actually getting that little piece um, of the, I believe it was the Spinthrift Isles, I think, um, and, and then basically getting to do his own thing and, and then kind of creating out his whole little uh, section there. And, and, that, and that is one of the criticisms. One of the criticisms was that there was a lot going on in a very small area. Mm -hmm. um, and I get that. And, and I think a lot of that is because he had that little tiny island to kind of work with. And, um, you know, I, I think he was probably all about the action. And, you know, we've talked, we've seen this in other modules. Um, B2 comes to mind where, you know, this is, again, this was 1981, this was published. Um, and, and, you know, the concept of dungeon ecology wasn't really uh, yeah. explored at that point. And, you know, that that's that's more of a modern kind of a, um, a concept, if you will, or maybe not modern, but certainly not back in the late 70s, because he wrote these actually in the 70s. So, um, 
you know, so I, I think that's that that's something to kind of be considered too. And I, that's probably one of the biggest criticisms we've seen is the fact that there's a lot going on in a very mm -hmm. tight space. So, but I think a, we have a bunch of people um in the chat already. Hello, everybody. Blaster, <laughs> G Blaster. Um, yes. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it certainly does. It looks like, yep, yep, yep. It looks like you are graying. That's it. Yeah. I'm just, uh, <laughs> so, going back to the forest next week. <laughs> yes. Go back to the forest or heavenly or something with your back. Yeah, something. So, heavenly may not fit, but we'll find. <laughs> yeah. Something. Um, so, so I want to talk a little bit about the artwork in this module. You know, a lot of these yeah. these classic modules, we 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 talk about the artwork as a, as as a big defining um part of these modules and and you know first of all cover of this one is phenomenal um, phenomenal yes love uh you know like it. i said put yourself in the shoes of a of a of a 12 year old boy and and seeing that on a shelf and and wanting it you know very it reminded me a lot of the classic appendix and covers of the novels um you know where they would show you some action scene and just you know and you would just be all over like i need to read that because I want to know what's going on there. Um, but that being said about the, 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 the cover, um, I would say the interior are not so good. Um, yeah. You know, the pieces are very small. Um, they're not highly detailed, probably because they're small. Um, several of them are very dark and you actually can't even really get a good uh, a good feel of of the artwork in that. Um, so definitely of the modules we've reviewed so far, the interior art and overall, I would say the art outstanding from the cover, not that great. Um, what yeah. do you think about the art, Rick? No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I love the front cover. I love the back cover, mm -hmm. uh, especially the front cover though. I, I like to joke that any cover with lightning is never a bad co cover, Yeah, but it's so dynamic and that's what I love about it, you know? Yeah. Is, is there's such a feeling of action. And then, like you said, you go inside and it's kind of blase. And even the inside cover shot, and I'm going strictly by memory here of the, well, actually, you know what? I've got it yeah, it's, got here. Yeah. All right, this one, because I don't yep. think we have a graphic and people, folks can see that. Um, I don't know, that shot always had like a sort of Asian or Mongolian kind of flavor to me that did not match the module at all. Like I really yeah. got the sense they just had that on the shelf and said, yeah, let's, you know, we got rights and, to that one. And, and I believe it was in the rumor table, that particular scene or what you would call, but I don't recall it actually in the module or playing a very large role in the module. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that it strikes me as that was like a cool piece of artwork they had and they said, Hey, let's use this. And, and, and let's talk about the back cover for a second. Um, put that up there. I know you can't see it with my background, yeah. but you know, very nice Hydra there and everything. And, um, yeah, there's, um, yeah, there's no Hydra in the module. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a nice piece of artwork. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So interesting, interesting choices on some of the artwork and everything there. So, yeah. And again, I like both the front cover and back cover, but like you said, at the expense of sounding, you know, like we're being nitpicky, I, I do at least, especially on the cover, I would like the art to have something to do with the product. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, and I think another part of why the, the interior pieces are so small is I just think, um, I just think uh, uh, Leo Mind, I call him Leo Mind because that's what, what I like to call him. Leo Mind was just very verbose and he and he put a lot of words and tables and charts and and description in there where I honestly think to fit this into 32 pages, I think they basically did not have a lot of room for artwork, you know, whereas there was some other modules where they're like, well, we're a page or two short, let's just get one of the art guys to do a full page spread of something. And, <laughs> You know that fills up page where we've seen that like almost to the opposite end of the spectrum this i think goes the other way where um yeah. they were like wow we don't want this to be 40 pages long so you know we'll just make the artwork shorter so uh very interesting i want to talk about the some of the new monster designs that um mm -hmm. were in this module so uh we got a couple of uh really good very interesting um on the monster designs on this and i, I definitely wanted to, to touch on this uh, the, so we have the spectator, kind of a beholder offshoot, a, a lower level beholder, if you will, with four hit dice, and the stone guardian. And those are the two, let's call them the two featured new new monsters in this module, because they got full write-ups in the back, and they were uh, certainly featured in some prominent encounters and everything. 
However, it, very unusual, and, and we're going to go right back to the cover. On the cover, we've got that great picture of what's clearly a, a Skeletor, uh, because the uh, the skeleton is getting ready to cast Burning Hands or something there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so we had the Skeletor and the Zombire, which were two low-level undead that could cast spells, which were very interesting. We had the Ghoul Sturge, which I was always fascinated with. Um, yeah. And we also had animal skeletons, which back in 1981, you got regular skeletons and you didn't get animal skeletons. So, um, yep. And we got a, a graphic and we've got some stats in there. And and I was um, inspired to use the Ghoul Sturge and the Zombier in, in one of our fifth edition fantasy modules. Um, and that's where the artwork and that's where the fifth edition stats are showing right now. Um, but it was interesting that those three did not get full write-ups. And... I kind of think we're kind of forgotten in 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 the history of D and D. Um, you know, Spectator and Stone Guardian, I think, end, ended up finding its way in. Oh, I don't know if it was the not the Fiendfold. I think it was the Monster Manual too. Um, but those guys mm -hmm. were not, and and then you didn't see them pop up in any other modules again. And I think that's very interesting. That you know, maybe they just ran out of space again. Yeah, that they didn't have room. I, you're right, because I've never well. I, Animal skeletons, they might have been in the monster manual too. They, but yes, I think they did eventually this, make their the, way. Yeah, but the skeletor, you're right, and the zombie, no, they never. Yeah. Uh, and and I feel they never really got their due. And 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 you think it's kind of strange. One was on a cover of one of the classic modules, and 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 there was a lot of things um, that uh, Leoman did um, in this uh, module where where he would give a crazy different version of a magic item or something like that or mm -hmm. you take a regular magic item and put a twist on it or something and just put it in the module and you know not do a full write-up on it or something like that he did that mm -hmm. a, he did that a lot and um and i like it it, it was getting some yeah. additional material out of it there's a lot of really good examples of that in there so yeah i agree i know off the top of my head they're like there's one room where there's sort of like for lack of a better term i'll call it a staff of blue dragon you know yes yep where he takes like a staff and he just kind of really riffs on the whole blue dragon thing and it's really yeah. cool i like it yeah. but like you said you almost wish that there was in the back they they gave a block for that for the dm you know yeah kind of like s4 um yeah. where they had a whole section of brand new you could easily have done that and again i i'm guessing he just did ran out of the space and mm -hmm. and probably they just put it kept it in the main part of the module instead of putting it at the end yeah probably just a design decision so um and then i guess we have to talk about the the skeletor in the room um yeah. you know yeah, the fact cool. that that this is not so much a module um but a setting um yeah. that is for, first of all i'm gonna ask you i'm gonna ask you right off the bat what is the secret of bone hill i that's it it's anybody the, in the chat anybody in the chat yeah, can somebody tell us it, what the secret of bone hill is i i like to call it i mean if i had a say i would say you know the fact that Bone Hill is seesawing back and forth between these two evil factions, you know, that are hidden inside, but it's kind of like, yeah, what is it? Yeah. I, I like to joke that this is a setting in search of an adventure and it's a good setting. I like that. It's a I really like good setting. Um, it's a, it's a great setting. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a, yeah. it, it is like, I, I call it the ultimate sandbox. Yeah. You know, we talked about I won yeah. being sandboxy, especially the second part of it when you got to the, the, the forbidden city. <laughs> This is sandboxy from mm -hmm. when you open it up till you get to the very end. This is yeah. literally a sandbox, and which is great, I think, when you're an experienced game master. But back in 81, there wasn't that many experienced game masters. There were a lot of folks like myself who were just figuring out like how yeah. to game master. And then something like this would confuse the heck out of you. Yeah. So. And, you know, it's something we talked about, I think, in our our pre-show you know conversation that we usually have but you know there's there's my memory of a module and then there's when i go back for these shows and reread these you know fresh mm -hmm. when i haven't some of these i haven't seen in months or years or whatever and it really struck me just how much that overall plot and bad guy and adventure hook is missing mm -hmm. from this even more than i remember and i remember it being that way but when i came back it slapped me in the face and at the same time, I was also struck by the incredible level of detail in this yes. on yes. the sandbox level. Like there's some classics like Isle of Dread that I have to be honest when I, and I love Isle of Dread, when I went back and really reread it, 
it wasn't as detailed and and beefy as I had remembered. You know, it was more like a nostalgia or the concept of the aisle as opposed to the implementation. Where in this case, he puts in a tremendous amount of detail. You know, yeah. characters can kind of wander hither or yon on this island, and the DM's covered. But I felt like, yeah, it's just almost a tragedy because I felt like this could be an absolute first rate classic that everybody would know on the tip of their tongue if it had, to me, if it had yeah. a really good plot hook and bad guy, you know, saw one solid bad guy in it. To me, this mm -hmm. would be an absolute classic, you know. Yeah. Um, and instead, we just have a really good setting and a really good, and it's still good. It's absolutely oh, yeah. first rate, you know, the detailing. The man obviously had the writing chops. Um, it's just missing that one element and it to me it's it's so tragic you know that it doesn't have that hook and when you're reading it you're kind of you feel like you're reading a gazetteer you're kind of like yeah you know, where's the beef where's the adventure in this yep, yep. well i'll give you, you know? i'll give you my hot take later on on what i think the secret of bone hill is okay um and and um and if like i said if anybody in the chat wants to wants to chime in if they remember this classic module if they want to chime in with what they think the secret of bone hill might have been or might not have been we'll never know but hey it's fun <laughs> we can you know we should do a top five list of what we think the secret of bone hill is. yeah the, the secret um, is you don't get the adventure until L2. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that is that is a secret. But it is. It's coming off of the heels of our last review where we did N1 against the Cult of the Reptile God, where there was a very defined plot. And you had the village and you had the dungeon and you had a very well-defined way to get there. And we, we, we lauded that module because, because of that and had a very defined big bad. Um, you know, then we come to this where not so much and again it's great i mean the we get a whole we so we get an amazing wilderness section um that is almost written like a field guide broken down in flora and fauna mm -hmm. and 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 that contour map if we could pop that contour map up um yeah. that contour map is amazing and and i know that everything is close everything's you know a couple miles apart or whatever but um but it's fascinating on 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 what he did in that and then then we get we we get the ruins of of bone hill which is great um mm -hmm. you know because it's interesting there's some very compelling encounters in there and we're going to yeah. talk about some of those later on um and then we get the uh, we get the castle of of restonford which again we get pages of that and an, an amazing map and again the detail the detail of yeah. like yeah. how that place could be defended and 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 where all the NPCs and everything, it's amazing. And and I we I love that detail. I, I've used that castle. I've taken and even he even mentions that in the module that you're not gonna need this until L2. He gives you the ultimate tease in there, po quite possibly a tease almost as big as as um you know, Temple of Elemental Evil is coming after Village of Hamlet, except this one did come out now mm -hmm. you know l3 is a another story but yeah. um so that was fascinating it was actually teased in the module like two or three times um and then but i remember i used that castle i just took that whole castle and i remember whenever i needed a castle you know that was my castle it was my go-to castle and i used that my back in when i was back in the 80s designing yeah. things for the first time that was my go-to castle floor plan Mm -hmm. you know to look at and that and, and that's why probably why i have such a favorable opinion of this mm -hmm. module because i got to use those materials on it between the wilderness part and the castle and then there's the village too the village yeah. was was well designed as well i mean yeah. without a doubt and by this point we'd gotten a couple of other previous villages but you know you can never have too many i don't think no lots of good lots of good environments here lots of good detail in those environments you know you get a castle, you get a ruined castle. It's kind of, you know, you get a, a good laid out town with, you know, inns and such. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is, it, it, it's, 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 it, it just hits the, the, the sandbox, um, you know, chord perfectly um, mm -hmm. in, in that it has all these different things. You know, another couple other things that I would probably, um, you know, say that I, I didn't particularly care for. Um, it was a little bit on the high magic side. You know, there was the, the, you know, some of the magic items that you get in some of the things in there, there was, there was, you know, wishes are being thrown out. There was one thing was like, you know, oh, if you get cursed by this, only a wish could, you know, remove it. I'm like, we're talking second to fourth level characters here. Like wishes is, you know, five years down the road, five years real time down the road, yeah. um, you know, at least. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And then one of the other things I thought that was actually missing 
that I felt was was a really nice part of like Isle of Dread and um, some of the other good classic modules that we've already talked about, uh, like um, uh, Forbidden City, was that further adventure section where mm. you always had that. If there was a module that needed a further adventure section, or here's yeah. an adventure section, <laughs> um, you know, was this one? I mean, this is the one yeah. that you know you that you know. I'm guessing they just ran out of space. I don't know, mm. but like you know, that would have been great. A, a half a page on here's some different things that you can do, or here's a couple of NPCs that you can go take off onto a different tangent or something. I think would have been would have been amazing. Um, in my yeah. opinion and i you know it's the more you mention it it really almost feels like a space issue like somebody was constrained to a number of pages with this one um because you know clearly lakovka puts in the detail you know if you're familiar with his column and dragon you know his love of tables and details yeah. and he certainly fits that in a lot of these encounters you know and, and like i said i miss those kind of columns where they you know sometimes they would go into this horrifying detail in these columns for these little mundane activities or things in D&D, but it was fun to read. And he injects a lot of that into this. Um, but yeah, there's certainly some, some of the, it, it, again, if we could have just the main theme and if we could have, like you said, talk about a module that needs that extra, you know, further adventures section. Um, yeah, definitely. A couple of comments in the chat. So um, Gronk says that the secret uh, is clearly that his was missing the first three pages the first and the last three pages so yeah that's gonna you know wow yeah especially since this jumps right to it too there's not a whole lot of introduction yeah that. that's not good yeah and then um let's see uh another comment from uh g blaster uh would i would we say that this that the castle is very insertable into another campaign i would say yes i mean yeah. it's a simple castle it's not complicated mm -hmm. um but i think that's fine depending on what the, the story that you're trying to tell Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, I used it a lot. I mean, my players might not have ever known it, but they've been to Restonford Castle probably four or five times <laughs> in uh, different characters and different parties and that. And yeah, yeah I've always yeah, added a couple little tweaks here and there, but I've always liked the simplicity of the design um, and the tightness of the design too, that I felt that it was just like perfect. So, um, mm -hmm. all right. So uh, yes, and it is indeed very, very modular. Absolutely. The module itself is very modular, so. Yeah. Um, well, shall we, um, do you have any other comments that you want to get to before we jump into our top five? Um, no, I mean, the only other impression that struck me, and I think this dovetails with what you mentioned a little bit is, um, the, you know, when you talk about the high magic and that kind of thing is it could be difficult in sections. There are yeah. places, I mean, in, in places it shows its age with things like treasure, because there's like yeah. one Smith that has a beaker of endless potions or something. They say, oh, it's worth 10,000. So, you know, a Smith just having a 10,000, you know, GP value magic item in, a, in an adventure that's levels two to four is a little extreme even for first edition. But then the deadliness factor, there's one trap that right off the top of my head, I can think of the spring, spring door that does like six to 60 damage and can yeah. even amputate a, a limb for good measure. Yep. <laughs> so again, for second, you know, second or third level characters, I could see that being like, you know, particularly brutal. Yeah. Um, so and that kind of jumped out at me a little bit. Yeah, there, there were several traps actually where yeah. they did quite a bit of damage considering that you were second to fourth level and back in first edition, you know, that probably meant you had about 10 to maybe 20 hit points. Right. Um, and there was, there were several instances where there was like four to 40 damage and yeah. stuff like that. And that, that is a lot of damage. That's a lot oh, yeah. of damage for, for that level. Um, you know, I, I'm not oh, yeah. Uh, sure we saw a whole lot of magic user going into yeah. those traps it'd be brutal <laughs> yeah i'm not sure we saw a whole lot of six to 60 damage in like uh tome of horrors i'm like i mean there was some deadly stuff in there that was you were just mm -hmm. dying but but like that i yeah some of those definitely jumped out i i would agree i would agree so um okay any caveats to start off on your list or anything or uh, um no i i stuck to i think yeah, I stuck to all areas, except for my, I have a sort of honorable mention in there that's not quite an area. So I do have an honorable mention this time, but. Okay, I, I do have an honorable mention as well. Um, okay. But we'll, we'll we'll get to that, I think. I think we'll jump in. So do you want me to start or would you like to start? Um, why don't you start this time? I'll let okay. you start. I'll we'll start this about. time. All right, so here are my top five encounters, starting at number five and going down. Um, so my first, my fifth 
favorite encounter is you know it it wouldn't be on my list if i didn't have a statue room in here <laughs> so a area bd um and that was on bone hill i believe uh the statue room um again it, it was it's just amazing to see what the original writers of this game could do differently with statues over time uh and this one was a little bit different this room had um uh, had a stone guardian in it. I keep thinking stone golem, but not, but basically a stone guardian that, you know, levels two to four could, could kind of handle golem a construct, if you will. Um, so that was cool, you know, using, you know, featuring the new monster in there. Um, you had some crazy stuff with the passages. You had one passage was kind of partially blocked where you had to kind of, you know, put some backbone into actually, uh, uncovering it. You had, a, you had a portcullis that was actually really hard to uh, bend the bars or lift. Mm -hmm. um, you had then an alcove with a statue of a woman wearing a brass helm set with a ruby. And you could like destroy it and get the ruby and the ruby was worth a lot. But the helm was actually magical. And um, if you were a good, if you were a good worshiping, if, if you worshiped a good deity or if you were a paladin or a, a lawful good cleric, um, you could actually remove the helm and you could put the helm on. Um, you could pray. You could, first of all, you could pray and it would grant you um, a limited contact to other planes spell, which is like a fifth level or sixth level spell. Um, again, a little bit, there's that high magic kind of coming in there. Um, and then, uh, But then also you could use the helm as a helm of true seeing um, mm -hmm. three times a day, but you would then have this like side curse thing where you would have a, a minus on your saving throws versus mind effects for an entire week so um it definitely that's good because that was a powerful item to give out to second to fourth level characters potentially mm -hmm. um so it was nice to see that drawback and that was i think that was definitely a, a classic uh, a kind of a a, a a a hallmark of what he did where he'd give you something but maybe there would be a drawback you mentioned that 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 potion the, the beaker of ever plentiful potions earlier um, it had limited number of charges and nobody knew how to figure out how many charges it was so it seemed like you were just getting potion after potion but eventually it would wear off so yeah. and it would just not become magical anymore so he was good at doing that kind of balancing things out like that and that's a good sign of a designer when you're gonna because everybody loves to give out powerful items um always give a drawback or or yeah. some yeah. kind of a you know some kind of a balancing factor there mm -hmm. so that's my number five the statue room Nice. All right. My number five, and I'll say for my number five, I seesaw it among three areas, including the one you just mentioned. And I kept honing in on these just small traps. So this is not, this is perhaps a more minor item, more minor, minor area than my other ones I list on my list, I think. But uh, area six in the guardhouse, uh, the living chamber, there is a really peculiar trap here where if you tip over a chest, you can break this potion of gaseous, you know, form that then causes the entire chest to become gaseous and rise to the ceiling. And then this process can repeat itself. And it's very emblematic of the whole work to me because uh, I really, the more I read, read this or reread this, I realized Len, to me, one of his strengths is taking these traps and tweaking them and just making them really yes. interesting i found more and more the rooms i really thought were cool and fun were the ones where he, he were his trap rooms uh so yeah this area i just thought it was i give it my number five because i just thought it was a really cool interesting trap i could see players trying to figure out treasure in this chest and i just thought it was really interesting it wasn't something i ever would have thought of doing and i think it's cool so yeah my number five is just this particular trap chest in the living chamber Excellent. All right. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, my number four is actually it's a collection of rooms. It's area B1, BJ, and BK. This is the Wraith Lair um, mm. in Bone Hill. Um, this is my hot take. I think this is what the secret of Bone Hill mm. is. I think it's the Wraith. Um, mm. And uh, the Wraith was apparently a strong and dreaded warlord um, mm. who made a pact with a devil um and was granted undeath um but his his rooms his chambers and, and he can be encountered in other areas of of the ruins um but in these this inner sanctum if you will he actually got some extra abilities he got to regenerate and he was immune to some spells um i like that i like the hint again it seemed like there was more to this story i wanted more i think when i ran this module a couple times I believe I kind of made this the big bad and I kind of made this the mm -hmm. what you were trying to figure out. 
um, if mm -hmm. I recall correctly. Um, and I kind of looked at and he had this deadly ability where he could summon all of the undead left yes. in the ruins to yes. his room. And, and yeah. it was funny. They even said it's a dude who's incorporeal. He couldn't actually open up the door. So mm -hmm. it's like if the PCs opened up the door, then all those undead come in. But otherwise, when they go to leave the room or leave this sanctum, mm -hmm. uh, all the undead are out there waiting for them. So I was like, yeah. it's, it's kind of a neat thing. And again, the loot, a little bit on the over there it was like a plus three shield, a plus two battle axe, and, and just to top it all off, you know, a ring of <laughs> elemental command. And But it was cool. It was really neat mm -hmm. where he actually gave you a couple of ways on how it could be activated. Because mm -hmm. if you recall, I mean, that's a, that is a, like a legendary type item where there's not supposed to be a whole lot of those rings floating around and you're supposed to be a pretty detailed way on how you get them activated. Um, and it was, it inspired me. I actually used one of those in uh, Castle White Rock where mm -hmm. I put one on like level three and then I had all these ways that you could activate it. And those waves were like deeper in the dungeon. There were like other methods available to you there. So it was kind of like, you get this really cool thing, but it's just a minor ring kind of in the beginning. So you mm -hmm. waken it up. So um, definitely that was my, my inspiration for that. I mean, I know I, I know I pulled my inspiration directly out of this module for Castle White Rock. So, uh, so that was my mm. number four, the inner mm. sanctum of the wraith and what I believe to be the secret of Bone Hill. Yeah. Well, that, like I said, yeah, that's kind of similar because I, I perceive it to be the magic user slash Wraith. And the Wraith, I think, is definitely the big bad of this module, if, if we're going to find a big bad, to, yeah. in my mind. He, he's our big bad. And and they imply that the magic user and bugbears are sort of afraid of the undead, or I get the sense that in that equation, the you know, that symbiosis, yeah. the undead are kind of the stronger or the more feared of the two. So, yeah, they're definitely the, the, the big bad. Yep. Uh, nice. All right. My number four, and again, this is an odd area, but I just thought it was a lot of fun, is the Church of the Big Gamble. Uh, there's a wilderness area where they detail this church with a bunch of gambling clerics in it. And I love sub games. I love games within games. I recently did something in my own campaign where I had my players uh, participating in carnival games, like, you know, shooting bows and arrows at targets for prizes and you know, wrestling and arm wrestling and things like that. And sometimes that's fun to inject that sub game stuff in there. And to me, the Church of the Big Gamble, there's a lot of role playing opportunities here. It can be a place where the characters can return and, and get a lot of information from these clerics and even some, you know, realistic aid uh, if they don't push it too hard. And yet they made the clerics not your typical good clerics. They're more, you know, because again, it's about gambling and it's, it's, it's fun that the characters will kind of stumble into this almost inner sanctum and they could kind of lock themselves into this gambling room with these clerics. So that's my number four, four just because I, I think it's a hell of a lot of fun and provides some role playing opportunities. Yeah, great. Um, okay. Uh, my number three, our first crossover. Mm -hmm. The Church of the Big Gamble. <laughs> I love the Church of the Big yeah. Gamble. Um, I actually thought about putting this higher. Um, uh, for all the reasons that you mentioned, um, I, again, a little bit crazy. It's like a 10th level priest and a 9th level yeah. priest and then a bunch of 4th level priests. But I love the I love the um, the the chance that they could help you out. But like, I mean, I always took it even a step further where they had to gamble depending on how much they would like pay for their you know, it's like, okay, do you want to mm -hmm. pay 200 gold pieces for the cure or do you want to try your luck? And, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I did all sorts I of crazy it. things on that um, where yeah. it's like, you know, maybe it was going to cost you 400, but maybe it was going to cost you 100. So so I did like that for the, the role-playing possibilities of it. It was a little bit weird that it was this church out there, but, you know, I guess it kind of makes sense. I mean, a, 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 a gambling clergy, um, you know, is a little bit weird, like, you know, I guess maybe in a big city, but I guess sort of it made sense that they're almost like a cult or whatever, and they're kind of doing their own thing. But and again, the detail on their 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 actual chapel that they were in and everything with the yeah. glass steel windows and mm -hmm. and the treasure and and the spells and I and I love the fact that one of the one of the the clerics could go with you and they were all detailed named and everything. They give a little bit of personality. Yeah. Um, I love that they could. That they could um you know one of them would would possibly be an npc and come along and mm -hmm. then like you said they were a great font of knowledge for the rest of the region 
Um, yeah. So they were a, a, a perfect lead in to get out some of those rumors and whatnot. And I really like that because that, I mean, that, the rumor table in this module is great. I, I oh, yeah. forgot to mention that there's like 36 yeah. rumors. That's like yeah. almost double the number of rumors we normally get. Yeah. And, and again, some of them were pretty compelling and some of them were left out there to be like, go for it, Game Master, figure it out on your own to yeah. develop that, design that. So um, so I thought that was great that early on, at least early on when you're reading the module, you got an opportunity of, hey, here's a bunch of NPCs that can yeah. help you out with information. And, 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 and then again, and that little drawback that he added, that little, mm -hmm. that little, oh, but if they come here too often, yeah. like, you oh. know, they might not be so friendly. <laughs> yeah, so they're, you know, he's kind of alerting the game master in a way. Don't let your players let be, have these guys be their crutch. Yep. But in a way, though, at the same time, it provides what I call touchback NPCs. And that one of the things I like when I'm running my characters to an adventure or, or definitely a campaign is to have certain reoccurring NPCs or, or, or NPCs that, you know, they kind of go back and report to it. They go back occasionally for knowledge, and, you know, bits of knowledge. And, you know, the, these kind of trusted NPCs that occasionally, you know, the characters or the players will purposely on their own decide to want to go back and visit. And I could see these clerics being built into that sort of resource for the players. So I, I just enjoyed the hell out of that area for that reason. Yeah, um, yeah, agreed. So our first nice. crossover, first crossover. Yeah, that's was, number one. Yeah, we'll have to see if we get another three. one. I'm, I'm hoping on one more at least. Okay. All right, so where are we? So that was my uh, number three, Ron, your three? number three. All right, my number three is uh, Area W in the Bone Hill Castle Ruins, which is the workshop. Um, I love wizard workshops. I've loved wizard workshops since B1 in Search of the Unknown. So I'm a sucker for these areas with this cool apparatus and potions and this kind of, you know, stuff that the players can, you know, the wizard's table kind of stuff that the players can investigate. And, you know, here Len really details these weird mixed potions. You know, he, he's got a potion of, uh, I don't know what it is, polymorph and vampiric control or something and he details about that. And just, the weird mixed potions and the great detail again that he goes into talking about you know if they imbibe too many potions how they can become toxic and the weird effects of the potions again it's just role-playing opportunities i could see it being a really memorable fun room when you're playing with the players and going through as they're experimenting with these different things and things are happening you're describing to the players this is what you feel you get this unusual urge could you drink the potion um I love rooms like that, that really, you know, give players something to investigate because they're good for in between combat, you know, when, when you need a breather from fighting the bugbears or the undead, now you can experiment in this room and have some fun. So that's my number three is the workshop because I, I just, I'm a sucker for areas like that. Okay. And number three, and, and I would agree. I think, um, you know, I guess I didn't remember until I reviewed these when I was going to come up with this list on how many really interesting um, encounters there were mm -hmm. um, along the lines of this encounter where it was, and, and the Church of the Big Gamble, you know, where they were a little bit different, a little bit, you know, not just a standard here, come in, beat up some bad guys and that you had a little bit of, a little bit of something extra going on there. So um, definitely um, there was a, a really good selection of this. It was actually, there was a really good selection to come up with this list and everything. Um, okay, my number two is Crossover number two, the workshop. <laughs> so now I understand why you had me go first. Um, because that way you wanted to get yours out after. There we go. Anyway, uh, so yes, area double the workshop for, for almost all of the things that you just mentioned. Um, again, it was, it was a different feel for some of the other encounters. Um, it was more of a, you know, explore type room. Um, it was fascinating. I, I love the fact that he had a table in there for if you drank uh, a, a mixing table, if you're in your stomach, like if you drank one and then drank another one uh, within a certain amount of time that there's something could happen, either no effect or a mild poison or a toxic poison. Um, and, uh, and those eight potions that were, you know, four of them were normal, but four of them were mixes. And I love the fact that he gave those, those, um, you know, role-playing cues on what it felt like when yeah. you drank them. And I, I think, I think a lot of people really grabbed onto that because I, you know, there was a lot of, oh, I find a potion. What does it do? I take a little sip. Oh, you know, you get a tingling sensation on your tongue and, you know, your hand shimmers or something like that. And you're like, oh, is it invisibility? Is it heroism? What is it? 
I think this this encounter might actually have been that first time where we got that little mm. glimpse of here's a way you might be able to figure out what a potion does. Um, and I thought that was pretty fascinating because I know when I was gaming back then, I never took the identify spell. That seemed like a waste of time. You know, nowadays sure. it seems like that's a staple. But um, yeah. but yeah, I, I I thought that was fascinating um, that he that he included those details on what it all meant. And it was funny that the, the one you mentioned was that the polymorph potion and the vampire control, it's like he went into details about the, the polymorph, um, but not the vampire control part. <laughs> it was kind of interesting, but it was cool. I was like the next monster you thought about or saw or creature, yeah. that's what you polymorphed into. I mean, it's fascinating. Good, good, good potential role-playing there. I thought that was really, uh, that was really solid. That was really solid. So that is uh, that is my number two area W the workshop. And if you want to nice. see what my number one is, I'm sure it's going to be. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah. Next one is going to be. Next time I'll let you. You know, next time I'll go first. Um, my number two, and we'll see if it, maybe this will be num your number one. Though I doubt it. We'll see. Uh, my number two is area BQ of the Bone Hill Castle Dungeon again. The curse study for or the study it's called. I think in the book. Um, and this is this unusual room where there's described in excruciating detail, there's this sort of anti-magic portal, you know, barring this area. But again, it's sort of really like a, a trapped area where the characters can penetrate into this room. And it's talked about how once they go in there, they will not want to leave. They'll just want to relax or they'll want to study or they want to write, which I think is fascinating. And there's books in there for them to read. So characters who kind of get trapped and enthralled in this area will just be laying about reading these books. And Len goes into great detail about how there is a picture that, you know, you can kind of summon this picture that these unseen servants will bring and it will fill itself with ice cold water or piping hot tea. And, you know, there's a mug that will fill itself with mead or ale that's finest quality. But at the same time, the characters are still kind of tra trapped in this very posh prison. Um, and then for good measure, there is a skeleton that's kind of, you know, chained up in this room that the characters can potentially interact with and get information from. Uh, and he's described so, or he or she or it is described. So I just think, yeah, it's a great room. It's a lot of, again, it's a trap taken to 10. And I think it's, it's done so well in that detail that I'm starting to really love now that I reread re it, uh, that Len's given it. So yeah, the curse study is my, is my number two. Excellent. All right. Um, and my number one is the curse study. Uh. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, and again, for almost everything that you mentioned, well, I can't wait to hear what your number one is. I have a guess at what your number one is. Yeah, um, I know. Where, where can I go now? I'm just going to stop I, there. <laughs> I think I might know. But um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I'll agree. The curse study is is great because it's a trap but it's not a trap that does six to 60 points of damage. Yeah. Like we just mentioned, it's a suitable trap for low level characters. Um, and there's a lot of backstory to it. It kind of makes sense. There is the anti-magic screen that holds the uh, unseen servants in the room. Um, yeah, and it was weird. So the skeleton, I really liked the skeleton part that and the skeleton was formerly up. 15th level, I think, wizard yeah. back then. Um, and you could cast speak with dead with him and he would give, he would talk to you, but he wouldn't give you any information about the ruins or the dungeon, which I was kind of like, ah, oh, if you go through all the trouble and get stuck here, and then if you cast the speak with dead, you should yeah. probably get something for all of your efforts yeah. there. Um, and I believe when I ran this module, I believe my car, I, I gave them information on the dungeon because um, I tied him in somehow to it, or mm -hmm. and, and um, I can't remember exactly, but but uh, but again, I think that was that was uh, that was Leonard's way to say, again, we're going to give you something here, but we're going to pull the reins back. We're not going to give you everything. Mm -hmm. um, we're just going to basically, you know, kind of tease you a little bit here and give you a little bit of something, something, um, you know. But and then there was a chance that if you released him. That you could get a limited wish spell, which is which is crazy to have a second to a fourth level oh, character yeah. get bestowed. Although limited wish is definitely not wish, but right. still, like to still. bestow something like that. And 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 again, he he put he put the he put the 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 chains on that a little bit too. He said that it was delivered telepathically, and the character had to decide right away what it was. He couldn't confer with anybody else. So mm -hmm. so you kind of put somebody on the spot really quickly. And we all know that when you put people on the spot 
and make them do a wish, it never goes well. So <laughs> yeah. never, it, it just never, never, go, it, it never goes well. So again, yeah, there was a lot going on. I, I've said this before in our previous videos. I like those encounters where there's a lot of different things happening. Yeah. This one definitely checks off all of those boxes. Um, and I just find it to be a very interesting, compelling encounter and, you know, a nice, nice change up to, okay, you got two bugbears and, and a skeleton, exactly. you know, yeah. that you have to fight. So, uh, so that's my number one. So I have a guess on what, um, on what number your number one will be. Um, but Go yeah, ahead. And, and then I'll give you my, my honorable mention. After. All right. Why don't you throw out your guess? So I'll give you a chance to get ahead of I'm going to guess it's the mirror room. My number one is the mirror room. Yeah, see, and it's funny, <laughs> and it's funny. You know, I looked at the mirror room. I looked at it really closely, and I thought about putting it in there. But at the end of the day, it was just a mirror of opposition, and true. I felt it like true. really did too much. But this is probably the first time the mirror opposition was used. Probably, I mean, this is eighty-one. Probably the first appearance of it actually in a dungeon. So I, I almost gave it some props for that. But yeah. I, I thought about the mirror room, but I just felt that um, it just it just it wasn't that interesting. Yeah, in and I, I agree with your points. In a way, it's really just a mirror of opposition, sort of described, perhaps in a you know. But I I, I like the fact that he kind of uh, takes it to the point of having the characters transported to a sort of demi plane, you know, yes. where they, where they, as yeah. opposed to just you know opponents coming out of the mirror in wherever they are. So the characters can't escape they're essentially trapped with their duplicates and anybody who tries to assist, of course, the first person is trapped with, you know, they're, they're pulled in and they get a duplicate. Um, so I like that element. It made it even more dangerous. And like you said, I think it's the first time I ran into a mirror of opposition and I really see saw it between this and the curse study. I kept flopping. I think them on my list. Um, but again, it's just, another example to me of a room that's so much more interesting than just throwing in a couple bugbears and, and calling it a day you know it's yeah. uh because i've run mirrors of opposition back in the first edition days because i always thought it was just such a cool you know kind of role playing slash combat opportunity and my characters were always took that as almost like a personal challenge it's funny even though they were sort of fighting themselves for some reason, the characters are always a lot more passionate when fighting their duplicates or their clones or whatever you want to call them than when just fighting, you know, humanoids or any other opponent. I always found the characters, you know, players got very invested in it. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. So, yeah, that's my number one uh, is the mirror room. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. It was, it was, it was, me right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought about it. And maybe that was ultimately why I didn't put it on my list. But it, it, it just I felt like the other ones were just a little bit more compelling and a little bit because, again, I, I thought going into this when I was first doing my list, I was like, yep, that's going to be on my list. And then when I got to it, I was like, ah, yeah. it's really just a mirror of opposition. And I'm like, probably the first yeah. time. But you know, but still at the same point, I mean, that was in the Dungeon Master's Guide, I believe. So it wasn't yeah. like it was he created, although maybe, maybe he did create it for the Dungeon Master's Guide. You yeah, know. who knows, I mean, right? It's, uh, entire, it's entirely possible, but it, it wow. was pretty fascinating. So three out of five crossover rate of three out of five. That's yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. pretty yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of figured that. I can figure. Uh, did you have an honorable mention? Yes, I do. Um, why don't you go first with your honorable mention? Lord? Okay, my honorable mention is another crossover with one of your encounters. It was wow. it was the burnt guard station with the chest trap and everything. Oh, really? Oh, that's um, so cool. Yeah, and 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 I, you know, I I never thought you'd pick that in a million years. Really? Too. Well, because I, you know, I'll be honest with you, I thought that one was going to be on my list definitely um, until I actually again read it and reread it. Mm -hmm. And there was like no treasure in that chest. <laughs> there was, yeah, there was yeah. like, it was cool and it was a nice setup, but there should have been something really cool in there. Agreed. Yeah, there was this medallion again where he where he does this great stuff where he puts a medallion in there that lets you give you gives you a saving throw on sleep spells. Back in first edition, yeah. the sleep spell was deadly. If you oh, ran yeah. into an NPC spell that caster that cast sleep on you, you were done. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if yeah, you yeah. you were you were probably if you gone. were a low level magic user, you took sleep spell. It was like yes. almost an automatic. <laughs> it was it was it was you know magic missile and sleep, and you basically mm -hmm. you, whatever you did worked. I mean all yeah. the time, but you know, it, but that was so you know giving you a medallion that gives you a saving throw on a first level spell doesn't sound like it's that great, but it was kind of cool. But but literally there was like there was that belt buckle in there that could poison you, <laughs> and it was like and then there was the the medallion, and then there was the potion, which most likely you weren't 
start getting the potion because if you trip the trap, the potion dumped or whatever. So, um, yeah, so that, that one, I, I liked it. It was interesting. Um, it just didn't end up being, um, it didn't crack mm -hmm. my top five, but I definitely liked it though. So what is your honorable mention? All right. My honorable mention is not much as much an area as more of an NPC. And that kind of goes to uh, Qualton, which is the, he's the abbot in the Abbey of Falcon, I'm going to pronounce it. Um, they describe how this particular NPC, his alignment is shifting toward neutral evil because he was uh, injured by a psionic blast that has then given him, you know, schizophrenia or, or some, you know, uh, basically caused mental damage. And again, I think it's it's just a it's a very cool thing. It ties into the first edition psionics, you know, mm -hmm. and the effects of psionics. It's, it shows that Len was kind of you know very uh, aware of what the side effects of these different psionic blasts and things could be. And they don't even talk about where he received this injury. They just simply say, you know, he took a psionic blast to the head, and this is what happened. And it's even gone to the point where he's sort of um, pretending to be good. And he's already started a worship of a, a you know, secret God. And it says something along the lines of like, he could still conduct good rituals and, you know, but he's trying to avoid that, I guess, because he doesn't want to be discovered. And uh, I like that. And, and I think there's a note in there that if you kind of go along the Lenore Isle series, then I guess he comes up later where you're not supposed to go with that particular avenue of him changing alignment. But I just think it's a good little nugget in there. It's interesting. It's something a, a DM can potentially either ignore or they can grab it and really run with it. So, mm -hmm. um, and as somebody who's had evil clerics embedded in good churches <laughs> and, and tortured <laughs> my players with that, maybe I have a soft spot for that. So uh, that's my honorable mention is, is the NPC quality. And I just thought that was cool. Um, okay. All right. Well, that's, that's good. All right. So that is our top five list. Uh, we do have a question from Virtual Wizard. Does the save work on spells that do not have a save? Um, yeah, I believe that was the whole purpose of the medallion because in the original first edition sleep spell, you did not get a saving throw. Um, and this gave you a saving throw. Now you still could have bombed that saving throw, but at least it gave you an opportunity for a saving throw. So interesting. Again, not a not a major magic item, but you know, certainly an interesting magic item, something that I could see, you know, I always felt that when you got those magic items when you were like second level or third level, and then you're when you were tenth level, you're like, wow, remember when I got that magic item and it was like yeah. Just so much special and all that. Um, yeah, so, and then we got a couple other comments too on when Temple of Elemental Evil is coming. Uh, we do not know. I mean, it has been at the printer. Um, uh, hopefully you guys are aware that there's definitely a shipping crisis going on in the world. So um, as soon as we have a concrete update on when that's going to hit stores, we will let you know. I know our target date was August and we submitted everything um, to the printer where it would be in time for August, but we will we'll find out. I know August is only a couple of weeks away. Um, and then I see some comments in there about what the next one is gonna be. We have not announced the next OR module yet. And then yes, we got to vote for the G series. Um, probably not gonna do the G series because um, Wizards of the Coast already did that. So, um, but yeah, so to scratch that itch in a different way. Um, so, uh, any other final, um, final words on L1, The Secret of Bone Hill? Um, no, just to reaffirm what I've already said and the fact that I really enjoyed the detail on going back and rereading this one. Uh, you can tell that the guy who wrote Liam Munn's Tiny Hut is the man writing this module because there's almost too much detail. There's almost too much like finickiness in each encounter and limitations and details and Every single room feels like he took something and tweaked it a little bit. So you, you need a little bit of DM care when you're going through this one. But I love it. I love the detail. I think it's it's a wonderful setting. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, there what we 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 both agree there wasn't a whole lot of module there. It wasn't a whole lot of adventure. Uh, like I said, there wasn't a whole lot of plot there, story yeah. there, but a whole lot of potential for adventure. Mm -hmm. Um, and certainly a lot that you could do with that setting. Um, yeah. you know, probably should have been. Um, advertise a little bit more for an expert game master than than you know beginning because it did say it was well they specified it was for beginning and intermediate players didn't say anything mm. about the game master but yeah um, and back then you know when we we're talking I mean the game had only been out for six years at this point um, you know people were still trying to figure out how to play the game at that sure. point because 
it wasn't, you know, again, again, folks, there wasn't any internet. There wasn't, there weren't these, you know, videos that you could go one watch a, a 45 minute video and figure, okay, that's how you play D&D. You know, a lot of this, especially, you know, especially those first few years where it was hard to just get a copy of the rules yeah. and you got a photocopy from a friend of a friend of a, you know, we all know what happens when you made photocopies of photocopies, they got blurry and everything. <laughs> so back is, those are some, those are some issues we had back in the eighties. Um, you know, so again, at that point, it, the, the module was probably a little bit ahead of its time. You know, if it would have come out maybe a couple of years later, might have been yeah. received a little better. Maybe if it was uh, put together as, as the whole package of L1, L2, L3, maybe mm -hmm. maybe it would have been received better because this was more of the setup and everything. So yeah, this yeah. is the this is kind of the you know that you know when you first start watching a TV show, season one, you know those first you know the first whatever episodes are kind of setting the stage and you're kind of getting used to the characters and you're getting introduced to everybody. Yeah. You know you don't have those earth shattering plots and developments and yet you're just you're, you know those usually come at the end of season one um yeah this was l1 l1 yeah. was season one of yeah. of, of a two-parter essentially essentially a third parter um uh that we that we get to experience so um i would agree with that so um okay so we are just about it's about an hour in so um yeah. let's wrap it on up uh rick you got something to tell the folks Sure. Uh, well, first off, if you're enjoying what you're watching, please give us a follow on Twitch. Uh, if you're watching later on YouTube, we would love if you could give us a like or better yet, subscribe. That way you know when we're coming out with our next video. Because uh, and, and, you know, keep the comments coming. We have a list of books we'd like to kind of explore. We still have many books we really think we, you know, we need to get to. But we want to know the ones you want to hear about the most. So if there's modules you really want to hear about or books or whatever, old works, uh, TSR or otherwise, let us know. That being said, our next show is coming to you on August 1st at 8 p.m. And, you know, we're just going to continue the Lakafka love going and we're going to go right into L2, The Assassin's Knot, because the two modules are really so linked in our minds that we felt like we wanted to present them together. So uh, that is our next topic for our next show, uh, The Assassin's Knot. Yep. And, and that's, we, we, we debated about what our next topic was going to be. And we just really felt like, you know what, we should strike while the iron's hot and we should just jump right into L2 because it's so connected to L1 that if we waited six months from now and just jumped into L2, people were like, wait, what? L2? What is this? Uh, so, yeah. so we're just going to keep it real. We're just going to kind of kind of the continuation and, and hopefully we're going to get, you know, a little bit more love for L1 after we give us, give, give the treatment to L2. So. Um, we're going to jump into our pearls of wisdom next as we always end our show and I guess I'm going to start off this time so um, so I get a chance to nerf uh, Rick on what he's going to say. Um, my pearl of wisdom is um, and and we, we saw we saw Lakovka do it very well. Um, when you're going to give somebody a boon or an advantage, always give them a little bit of a drawback or a flaw or something, especially if it's overpowered. And again, there's nothing to say that you can't give a ring of invisibility to a first level character. Um, is it overpowered? Yes, but try and give some kind of drawback to that. Try and 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 try and make a role playing opportunity in there too, um, so that you it's just not all benefit. You know, give give, give something a little give and a little take, um, because we all do like that. You know, especially sometimes people are impatient. You might not want to wait until your sixth or seventh level before you get that awesome magic item. Uh, so maybe getting it early or, you know, I always like the concept of getting a, a, a magic sword, a plus one sword at first level, and then maybe it awakens and it becomes that holy Avenger down the road, you know, when your 10th level or something like that, but it's actually the same sword. Um, that's always kind of cool, but always, always when you, when you do that, keep, keep game balance in mind and always think of giving some kind of a, a drawback to something. That's my pearl of wisdom. Thanks. Excellent pearl. Um, my pearl does not, it's not the same, but I, I think it dovetails a little bit. Um, based on Len's wonderful example in this module, I would encourage the writers and DMs out there to go that extra mile in detail, particularly when it comes to your traps and your magic items. Um, and again, this is where it kind of maybe dovetails what you said, Chris. Um, write in extra abilities, details, limitations for magic items, keeping things balanced. And the same thing with your traps, rather than just, oh, here's a 10 foot pit trap, or here's a room with a couple of bug bears. Mm -hmm. Use this module, it's such a great example of so many rooms that could have been absolutely mundane rooms in that he elevated them by putting that extra level of detail 
instead of just giving us a rack of potions, he gave us a rack of potions with some mixed potions. He gave us details about what happens when they're mixed in your stomach. That extra level of detail that really, it makes the DM's job easier and it provides a lot more fun at the table. Um, you know, and, and check it with reason though, obviously. You don't wanna just throw random changes, you know, in where you say, well, this skeleton is purple and, you know, does this. Uh, but put that extra level of detail and, and, you know, change things just up a little bit. It makes it uh, encounter so much better. I, I agree 100%. That's a, that's a great one. Uh, one last comment in the chat from Gronk. Um, have we talked about against the cult of the reptile god? Yes, we did last yes. show. Uh, so go look that up. It's on YouTube now. Uh, you know, definitely you can uh, share that because that was one of our favorite modules and we had a great talk about yes. that. So. Uh, yeah, definitely check that out, Gronk, um, on YouTube. Um, and like I said, if you have want to continue the conversation on that, you can just leave a comment there. Um, or the next show on August 1st, feel free to drop in again, and we'll talk about it some more. So if you want. So uh, with that, uh, Rick, you have a very good rest of your Sunday evening. And uh, we will say goodbye to everybody for another couple of weeks. And we will see you again to talk uh, L2, the Assassin's Knot. Take care, everybody. So long, folks.